extravagant love of God for you today is incredible. As I drove in, I was praying for you and your congregation and all that's going on in your lives, which obviously I don't know the ins and outs, but I'm assuming that at times life can be a little bit challenging. And there could be things that happen in our lives that are less than encouraging. And uh, in a milieu of economic uh, struggles and difficulty, and uh, in some ways lots of political unrest around the world and war and, and all of this, it could feel a little overwhelming. But I'm here to remind us that the love of God is deep and it's wide for you. And the the word of the Lord says that nothing could ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing could ever separate you from the love of God. No um, difficulty can separate you, no challenge, no uh, sin that can easily entangle us. Uh, there is nothing, no trial, nor no demon in hell could ever separate you from the love of God. You could be assured of that today. Once you envision with me, it was uh, thousands of years ago when Jesus walked the dusty roads of our world. And as he walked one day in one of the villages, he had a crowd that assembled around him. Now, this was a, an interesting crowd of people. It was a, a mixed crowd of people. In fact, Luke 15 says that there were tax collectors and sinners that gathered around him, and there was Pharisees and religious leaders that gathered around them. Now, that was an interesting combination of people. You see, tax collectors and sinners, well, they were the ones that, that weren't living for God. They didn't know much about God, and, and, and many would look down on them because of their lifestyle, because of their life choices. So they were in the crowd that day. But simultaneously and uniquely, there was the Pharisees and the religious leaders also that day in the crowd. Well, these were in stark contrast to the tax collectors and sinners. These were the, the religious elite of Jesus' day. Many of them would have memorized the entire Torah or the Pentateuch in those days. And so they were the religious teachers. They were the religious leaders of the day. They would have been the ones that people would look to to understand the laws of God. And so here's this mixed group of people that were in the crowd. Well, of course, it says in Luke 15 that Jesus was not only teaching the crowds that day, but Jesus spent time with the sinners. In fact, verse 2 says that Jesus spent time eating in the homes of the sinners and tax collectors. Now, that's a really important piece of information because in Jesus' day, for someone to actually have dinner with someone meant that they were friends. So here's Jesus having supper with sinners and tax collectors, which meant he was their friend. Well, of course, the religious leaders of the day couldn't understand how this could be. If Jesus was truly the Son of God, the great rabbi that he said he was, the great holy one, the Son of God, assuredly, he would not be eating dinner with sinners and tax collectors. Assuredly, the Holy One would not be rubbing shoulders with such people with such low reputation. And so as the religious leaders that day heard Jesus teaching and had seen him befriend these sinners, they began to think in their minds and muttered under their breath, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Can you believe it? Then Jesus, knowing their thoughts, shared with them a few stories. The first story was a very simple story of a shepherd who had 99 sheep, but one of his sheep 
had wandered from the flock and had left the safety of the pen and had wandered up in the countryside. And Jesus says about this story, what would the good shepherd do? Well, he would leave the 99 behind because they were safe in the pasture in the gated area. But he would leave the 99 behind and go after the one wandering sheep. When he would find that sheep, of course, because every sheep mattered to the shepherd, perhaps he would take the sheep and put it around his, his shoulders to ensure safety. Perhaps that sheep had, had endured a long night without safety, with, with fear that predators would catch it. Perhaps the sheep hadn't eaten properly, hadn't drank properly. And so the shepherd, because he loves his sheep, will take it and carry it all the way back to safety. And when he gets back to safety, what does this shepherd do? Of course, he invites all of his shepherd friends over for dinner that night. Why? Because it's time to celebrate because what was once lost is now found. And so we need to celebrate. Goes on to a second story right after the first story. And he says there was a lady who lost her silver coins. In fact, the amount that she had lost was probably a, a, a two weeks worth of wages. And of course, that's a lot of money. And so what does she do because she's lost her silver coins? Well, she will turn on the light in her house to make sure she could see everything. She, she would take the broom out and maybe sweep the floor in hopes of finding the silver coins. She would do whatever she could. She would turn her house upside down just to find her well-earned wages. And when she finds it, what does she do? Well, she invites her friends over because today is a day of celebration. What was once lost is now found. So you can just envision the crowds of people that day again. The religious elite and the Pharisees or, and the sinners and tax collectors. He then reaches his third story, which is really the apex, the moment where he's going to drive his point home to the crowds that day. He starts off and he says this, Jesus continued, there was a man, in verse 11, and I believe the text will come up on the screen, there was a man who had two sons. Now I want us to stop there. There was a younger son and an older son. The younger son in the story, I want you to really catch this connection. The younger son in the story was a representative of the sinners and the tax collectors in the crowd. He had wandered, he had lived a wild life. He represented the hearers that day that were the sinners and tax collectors. But the older son would represent the religious ones in the crowd that day. I just wanted to give that as a framework of understanding what Jesus is about to say. So here he is. You ready? We're on the sideline. We've been listening to this. We're in the crowds of people. And Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, this was a patriarchal society. For a young son to go up to his father and ask for his inheritance was deeply disrespectful. It was one of the most dishonoring things a son could do to his father. In many ways, this son was saying, Dad, I, I wish you were already dead. <laughs> I wish you were already gone because I want my money. <laughs> I want my inheritance. And now in this patriarchal society, the younger brother would get one-third of the father's inheritance. The older brother would get two-thirds of the inheritance. Sounds a little unfair, don't you think? I'm a youngest son in my family. I got ripped off. <laughs> but this young son goes to his father and says, hey, dad, I want my money. I want my inheritance now. In many ways, saying to his father, I wish you were already What is the father who represents our God in the story? How does he respond to this deeply disrespectful comment from his young son? The scripture says that the father divided his property 
between them. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't scold him. He gives him what he asks for. Not long after that, this younger son got together all that he had, including the inheritance his father gave him, and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. He squandered it. He used everything his father had worked so hard to, 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 to present to his son. He squandered it and had nothing to show for it. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Boy, this son had reached the worst of the worst. He's bankrupt, nothing to show for it. He had an empty heart, an empty wallet. He had an empty life. He realized that all of this wild living that he thought would satisfy that, that, that God-shaped vacuum in his heart, that gap that he was looking to fill with all that the world had to offer, he realized that day that none of it worked, that it was deception, that the world said, you just need a little bit more of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And then you'll truly be satisfied. Then you'll truly be fulfilled. You just need that better job or that, that relationship or that sexual experience or, or a bit of that or a bit of that. And then you'll be happy only to realize he's emptier than he started. And there he is with nothing to show for it. He's in the middle of a famine and he's feeding swine. It gets so bad in verse 16 that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Wow. You know, sometimes when we go our own way and we realize that nothing this world has to offer can fill us, we become so desperate we know, don't know where to turn. And in that moment of desperation, this young son, who's deeply dishonored his father, who has squandered everything his father gave to him graciously, verse 7 says, he came to his senses. Something in him finally clicked, and he realized what he needed to do next. Scripture says that he began to think to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. The servants in my dad's household have it better than I do. And I'm his son. So he thinks of an idea. He says, I'll, I'll set out and I'll go and I'll go back home to my father and I'll say to him, and he prepared his speech. He's like, okay, and I don't know if he wrote it down or he thought it in his head and and he thought to himself, I'll just go back and and when my dad sees me, I'll say this, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer even worthy to be called your son. So here's the deal, dad. You don't even need to welcome me back into the family. All you need to, all, all I'm asking you to do is make me like one of your hired servants. I'll just be like any other servant in your household. That would be better than me feeding swine in a foreign country without no future and without a hope. So what does he do? He gets up and he begins the journey back home. You can only imagine all that's going on in his head and in his heart and in his mind. He's thinking, oh man, what's, how, my, how is my dad going to respond? What is he going to say? What are, what are all the other patriarchs in town going to think? What are all the other families who know what I did to my dad, how I royally dishonored him by asking him for my inheritance? And on top of that, I have coming home and showing nothing for it. And so he's, I'm sure he's got fear. He's got He's got pain, he's got regrets, he's, he's feeling shameful, he's feeling all sorts of guilt, kind of like us sometimes when we go the wrong way. 
when we ignore the ways of God and we go our own way and we sin and knowing what we're doing is wrong and you feel that guilt and that conviction of the Spirit and yet he's so desperate that he's going to go back home anyways and he's hoping that his dad would just make him one of his slaves. Remember who's in the crowd, the sinners, the tax collectors. At this point, as Jesus is sharing this, I'm sure they were thinking, I can relate to this kid. <laughs> I, I've done a lot of things in my life that are not, that are, that, that are not right, that, that I regret, that I wish never happened. <laughs> and yet, there they are etched in my memory. <laughs> Perhaps they can relate. And maybe the others in the crowd, the religious ones, they're getting all kind of with their back up going, what a delinquent kid this is. They kind of remind me like these people here in the crowd. Thank God we're not like them. Now watch what happens in the story. This must have put a hush over the crowd that was listening that day. Listen to this. But while this boy, this younger son, was still a long way off, his father sees him. His father saw him and was filled with anger. <laughs> was filled with hatred. Was filled with retribution. No. He was filled with compassion. Mm. I don't know how it all shook down. Maybe the father, after a long day working on the farm, on the land, was after a long day, and maybe at the end of a long day, he made it a habit after dinner to sit on his patriarchal rocking chair on the front porch of his home. And maybe this father would have spent countless hours, countless days thinking about his younger son. I'm sure there was moments in this father's heart where he thought, I wonder where my son is today. I've not heard from him. I don't know where he is. I don't know if he's accomplished anything with the inheritance. I, I don't know what land he's in. I don't know whether he's well or dead. I don't know anything. And that particular evening as he sits on his porch, he sees coming over the horizon what seems to be a young man. <laughs> and maybe he's squinting his eyes or maybe he picks up his glasses and he puts them on. Can it be? <laughs> Is it really you, son? Maybe he gets up and maybe he squints a little more and gets a little closer. Wait a minute. Yeah, it, I, think, I think it is. <laughs> I think it is. That's my son. <laughs> He's still a far way off. Hmm. The scriptures say he's, he's a far way off. But while he was still a long way off, his father sees him and is filled with compassion. I want, I want you to know something, that sometimes when we fail, the evil one wants us to feel so much shame that we stay far, far away because we convince ourselves that we're too messed up for God. I remember meeting a man and talking to him, who was, I think, in a grocery store, and I talked about my faith, and told him about church, and his response was this, I'll never forget, he says, I can't even go close to a church building because I'm afraid that God will send down a lightning bolt because of all the things I've done. Hmm. I want you to know that you're never too far off for God. You've never gone too far 
for God to still remember you and know you by name and still when he sees you be filled with compassion for you. See the extravagant love of God and it gets even better. The father doesn't just see this son over the horizon, but he not only gets up from his seat perhaps, but when he sees him and is filled with compassion, his compassion gives him a compulsion to get up and actually get this, he runs to his son. Now, I want, I want you to understand how significant this is. It's a patriarchal society. Fathers, patriarchs, don't run. Children run. Children run to the patriarch. Children run to the father. The fathers never were caught running. <laughs> it was something that was reserved for children to do. For a patriarch to run would be very undignified in a patriarchal society. Many of them would wear long garments, and so to run would mean they would be exposing their legs to all those around them. It never would this ever happen in a patriarchal society. Patriarchs don't run. Children run. But in this case, Jesus flips the script. The son isn't running to the father, but the father runs to the son. Now, some scholars would say that the reason why the father ran to the son is because he knew that if his son had to walk through town to get to his father, he would never make it to his father's house. You know why? Because all those other patriarchs sitting on their porches would have seen that young boy come into town. And they would have known what he did to his father. And guess what? They would have gotten his, their hands on him before he ever made it to his father. They would have thought to themselves, we're going to teach this young boy a lesson once and for all of how he mistreated his father. The patriarch, the father, knew something drastic was to be done this day. And so he gets up and runs in an undignified manner. Kind of reminds me of the cross, doesn't it? Jesus dying in the most undignified way. The king of kings himself. The one who created the universe. The one who's allowed himself to be controlled by the hands of the soldiers he created. Allowed himself to be crucified. Nailed to a cross something that was reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. And there he hung. <laughs> undeservedly. While the soldiers were gambling on his garments. While they mocked him and put a crown of thorns on, his, thorns on his head. Oh, if you're the king of the universe, why don't you save yourself? In that horrible death, the most holy one treated with the most terrible fashion. Mutters under his breath, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And here's the dad, in a very undignified way, running across town while his son was still a long way off. You know, some of us have bought into the idea that we have to get our life together before we can ever come to God. The reality is God will chase you down and he finds you just the way you are in your brokenness, in your mess, in your confusion, in your sin, in your dirty garb. 
He doesn't say, hey, get yourself together before you come to me. Instead, while you're a long way off, the Father is filled with compassion and he'll run through town in an undignified way just to get to you. Watch this. <laughs> it gets even, how can this get even better? The extravagant love of he throws his arms around his son. It doesn't say he grabbed hold of his son. <laughs> you getting this tonight? <laughs> he throws his arm around his son and kisses him. Can you imagine being that son that day? How is this even possible? That's why we call the gospel the good news. <laughs> None of us deserve it. None of us could earn it. It is given by grace. His grace covers over a multitude of sins in our lives. His son doesn't know how to react. Remember when he was feeding the swine? What did he say to himself? I, I've got a speech ready. The moment I, I, I get to connect with my dad, I'm going to tell him, Dad, just, just, just make me one of his higher hands. And so what does he do? He, he's, he's there. His father is embracing him. His father's hanging on him, kissing him on the, on the cheek. And the son breaks out into the speech that he rehearsed. While he was feeding the swine, he says, Dad, Dad I, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And verse 21, I love that. He tries to go into his speech, and his father ignores him. It's like, what are you even talking about? And look, <laughs> the father says, Servants, quick. Oh, you got to underline that word. Hurry up. <laughs> Quick. Quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Whose robe is the best robe in the house? Anybody? It's not a trick question. That's right. Remember, we're in a patriarchal society. The best robe belonged to the dad, to the father of the house. Servants, go get my robe and put it on my son. Yes, the one who dishonored me. <laughs> yes, the one who's got nothing to show for everything I gave to him. Put it on him. Doesn't that remind you of robes of righteousness? When we come to Jesus, we come with filthy rags. And what does he do? He puts his robe on us. We're not righteous because of our own actions. We're righteous because of the righteousness of God. And what he accomplished on the cross for our sins. Hmm, put the robe on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. <sighs> Do you know what the ring meant? There was a sense where it's this son is now back home. This son is now still part of this family. This, this love for my son is unending and cannot be broken. Because my love is deep, my love is wide, and nothing, including what my son will do, will ever separate my love from him. Put it on his finger. Hmm. 
this point, remember who's in the crowd. Those, 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 those sinners and tax collectors, I mean, there must not have been a dry eye in the crowd. I'm sure they were, this is their come to Jesus moment. Do you mean I can... I can be part of the family of God even though of all the things I've done? Even though as a tax collector, all the people I've ripped off? You're telling me that I could still be part of this family of God? And the religious leaders of the day would have been beside themselves. They would have thought to themselves, how did, what kind of patriarch is this? What he should be doing is a beatdown on this son today. And instead, he gives him his robe and he puts a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And it's still not over the extravagant love of God. You ready? What happens next? Bring the fattened calf. <laughs> he tells the servant, Br bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Now, let me stop there. In Jesus' day, the fattened calf was only prepared for very special occasions. Meat was something that was of a special moment to partake together. The fattened calf, the best of the best, was only killed and served at the most utmost special milestones of a family's life. Well, today doesn't seem to be like one of those days. This delinquent son of yours, who squandered everything you gave him, has come home. Definitely not the day to kill the fattened calf. Oh, but in Jesus' economy, it's very much different. Why? Because this son of mine was once dead, but is alive again. What was lost is now found. Hmm. Just like the shepherd who lost his sheep. Just like the woman who lost her coin. What was lost is now found. Today is a day of celebration. You see, when one person comes back home to the family, the angels in heaven celebrate. Because every single one of us matter. His wish is that none shall perish, but all have eternal life. You see, every person on the planet is created in the image of God. His fingerprints are upon every person in every corner of every part of our world. And his wish is that every single person, no matter their cultural background, no matter the language that they speak, no matter their social economic background, no matter their education level, Jesus loves them deeply. And his wish is that none of them would perish, but all have eternal life. That's good news. If you've come into this place and you can relate to the younger brother, it's not an accident or a coincidence that you're here tonight. The father has watched you from a distance. <laughs> and he sees you tonight. And his wish is that you would not be condemned but that you would be saved. He would come up to you and embrace you and kiss you and put his robe of righteousness upon you, put a, thing, a ring on your finger and sandals on your feet. He would say, quick, get the fattened calf because tonight we're going to celebrate. Now the story takes a little bit of a, a sharp right-hand turn. Amidst all of this great news, look what happens next. Meanwhile, the older 
son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Now, can I just stay, stop there? Anybody who says church should be boring should be banned. <laughs> they were celebrating the return of the son, right? With dancing and music. <laughs> it was a celebration. The older brother comes back from working on the field, and he's, he's not in the mood for a party. In fact, he hears all this ruckus and says, what's going on here? Why is there all of this music? What's the party all about? Because I've worked all day, and I'm kind of tired. So he calls one of his servants and asks, what's going on? And the servant says to him, well, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Stop there. Why was the older brother angry and confused to go in? Kind of a, an odd response when your own flesh and blood, who's been gone without any evidence of life, has come back home. But in this case, the older brother is ticked off. Not only has he had a long day, but now his father has killed a fattened calf because his delinquent son has returned home? This doesn't seem right. Hmm. Well, you'll remember that in the beginning of the story, I mentioned that the younger brother would have received one-third of the inheritance, and two-thirds of an inheritance was left to the older brother. The fact that he hears the father has killed the fattened calf, he makes, he, he's good at math, this older brother. And he starts to realize, hold up, wait a minute. If he killed the fattened calf, I bet you he put his robe on him too, and he probably put a ring on his finger, and he probably put sandals on his feet. And you know what that meant? That meant that this, this blank <laughs> is now back into the inheritance. And now that two-thirds is going to get impacted. Oh, now you're messing with my portion. Mm. Now you're messing with me. And quite frankly, I'm going to make sure that this doesn't happen. I'm not going into the party. Now, the fact that the older brother refused to go in was very dishonoring to his father. The fact that his servants would have had to go back into the house and tell the father, listen, your older son now is outside and will not enter the party. You're going to have to try to go convince him. All the other patriarchs in town would have seen that father have to walk through his house to try to convince his very own son to enter a party that he's thrown for his family in the community. It would have been very disrespectful. And he finally gets out to meet and have a conversation with his older son. And watch what happens next. If you can go to the next verse. His father walks out of the house, is about to engage his older son in a conversation. His son doesn't even let him open his mouth and says, look. Another translation says, look here. Listen up, daddy-o. Doesn't even call him by name. He just says, look. Are you listening to me? You, are you listening to me? Remember, patriarchal society. These conversations should never happen. Look here. All these years. I've been slaving for you and I've never, 
disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat. So I can celebrate with my friends. Not even a young goat, never mind a fattened calf. Next slide. But when this son of yours, not my brother, no, 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 he's not my brother, this horrible human being, whatever you call him, this son of yours, when he comes home, after squandering all your property with prostitutes, comes home, what do you do? You kill the fattened calf? Have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind, Dad? Has dementia set in? Seems a little unfair. But let's be honest here. It does seem a little unfair, doesn't it? It just doesn't seem like it's right. I've been slaving all these years and not even a young goat. Next slide. How is this father going to respond to this disrespectful older son now? Doesn't even have the respect to call him by name. Doesn't even have the respect to call his brother, brother. How is he going to repay this evil? My son. Did you catch that? <laughs> you don't even have the respect to call me your father. But I'm going to still call you my son. The extravagant love of God. My son... <laughs> You are always with me. And everything I have is yours. Everything. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is now found. You see, there's no seniority in the kingdom of God. You know that, right? Sometimes, uh, uh, for those of us who maybe have walked with the Lord for many years, over the years, we've almost become um, like we own the place. We should get special privileges because, hey, I've been given to this church for I don't know how many years. I'm the biggest ever here, you know, that this church wouldn't exist if I wasn't here. You see that wall over there? I built that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We, we, can, we can become overly dignified over time and forget that we were one blind beggar lost going nowhere and Jesus saved us. Not because we deserved it, not because we earned it. And we've become religious <laughs> and perhaps we've lost that love for Jesus you see the older brother was doing the right thing out of duty not because he actually loved the father you see that over the years we can do a lot of religious things because it's out of duty, I guess I got to do that. I've been doing it for years. It's kind of a habit anyways. Without the joy, without a deep love for the Father and what he's done for us. You see that? I wonder if in the story, many times we've said that the lost son was the young son. But perhaps the lost son in the story is the older brother. At the end of the day. I wonder, I wonder, just a thought for you to consider, if there's a connection to the story way back in Genesis chapter 4 between two brothers named Cain and Abel. You remember that story? Read it in your week ahead and then 
Read this ver uh, chapter again and see if there's a connection. Let me give you a little hint. Cain, the older brother, lured his younger brother out in the field because of something he did. And he ends up murdering his younger brother in the story. He then comes back home and his father asks him an important question. He says, where's your brother? Knowing full well that he murdered him because God knows everything. And his son says, what am I? My brother's keeper? Here's, the, here's perhaps something to consider. There's something about older brothers, older saints, those who have followed Jesus for many years. God has put a mantle on your life, a calling on your life to be your brother's and sister's keepers. Perhaps in this story, perhaps, what should have been happening is that the older brother should have been leading the way, the rescue mission, and trying to figure out what happened to his very own younger brother. Perhaps it should have been his responsibility as the older brother, as somebody who's been around for many years, who would have known a lot better, to make it his mission to find his younger brother and bring him back home. But instead... He stood in his religion. He made it all about himself and his own inheritance and forgot about the lost brother in the story. You see, Easter's around the corner. It's not just about us wearing pastel colors and eating chocolate, although all that is great. But there are younger brothers and sisters in your life those who are far from Jesus, those who are squandering their lives, God has called you to be your brother and sister's keeper. This is not about you anymore. It's about reaching all those who are far from Christ. That is your mission to life for the rest of your life, to bring the prodigals back home. It's not about whether you like the music at your church or whether you like the colors on the wall or whether you built that pole or whether you dug that hole. Hey, that kind of rhymes. That was kind of cool. <laughs> it's actually about those who are not yet here. That God has called you with the same grace that saved you to find them and bring them home.